When it comes to modern observations of outer space, there's always this one underlying question. Is there anything out there? And one of the ways we can potentially answer this is by studying the concept referred to as panspermia. The idea for life to transfer from one planet to another by, for example, taking a little nap inside an asteroid. And while we haven't really found any definitive alien life anywhere out there, what we have been doing for the past few years is still pretty exciting. Here, in several different experiments, scientists have actually been testing if life can even survive in outer space, and specifically figuring out how certain organisms seem to have evolved the ability to survive high radiation, vacuum, and the lack of any resources for a pretty long period of time. And today we're actually going to be discussing this new research that discovered yet another exciting organism that seems to be pretty okay surviving outer space. Specifically, we're going to look at this moss and the astonishing results of a major space exposure experiment published in a study you can find in the description by the Japanese scientists who performed this on one of the Japanese missions on the International Space Station. But apart from this moss, we're also going to take a look at some of the other creatures that survive space, talking about exactly how they're able to do so, and of course discussing this idea of panspermia and if it's possible for life from one planet to then migrate somewhere else. But here let's I guess start with mosses. A group of really ancient plants, referred to as bryophytes, that even today thrive in some of the most extreme conditions on our planet. And these plants are so ancient that they actually even lack true roots and instead usually have root-like structures called rhizoids that absorb water and nutrients directly from their surroundings. Likewise, unlike plants, they usually reproduce using spores and even have different generations and different life cycles depending on the stage of reproduction. But in terms of our planet, Mosses are super important, and that's because they're very likely the first land plants that evolved from aquatic ancestors and were able to colonize the surface. Based on a lot of fossils, we know they appeared approximately 400 million years ago, and actually even before that, allowing the plants to finally transition from water to land, but also developing a lot of partnerships with fungi, which then allowed them to take up a lot of nutrients not available to water plants. But they also developed a lot of survival strategies, especially because these early conditions were very hostile. Much higher UV radiation and a lot less water, as well as some really extreme temperatures. But today we think that mosses very likely influenced Earth's early climate and were possibly some of the first organisms to start affecting CO2 levels by mostly influencing rock weathering on the surface. And here is a really cool picture of a spore of a moss, which will eventually produce a new plant. If you were to zoom in, here is roughly what the cells would look like. But it was really the resilience of these plants that allowed them to colonize the entire planet. And today, the locations where other plants cannot survive very easily, you can almost always discover some kind of a moss. Anywhere from the Himalayas to the scorching sands of Death Valley, mosses are basically everywhere. Which makes this moss, Fiscometrium patens, also known as the spreading earth moss, an ideal candidate for testing some of the life's ultimate limits outside of planet Earth. So basically, what if we actually take this and try to put it into outer space? Although for this study, researchers mostly focused on the sporophytes, the protective structures that encase tiny moss spores that they then use for reproduction. And the first test was here on the planet. They basically tried to recreate space conditions in the lab. And so first they froze the moss, then they produced extreme heat and extreme UV radiation. And so basically the first three tests were simulated space exposure, with the results clearly showing that spores encased within their protective capsules were indeed the toughest part of the plant. For example, they could easily survive up to a thousand times more UV radiation compared to the actual plant, or even compared to some of the other mosses. And interestingly, they could even survive temperatures of minus 196 degrees Celsius or 55 degrees with at least 9% of them surviving. Or even as hot as 55 degrees with the third amount of the spores then germinating even after 8 days. And so because of these exciting first results, researchers decided to basically take these plants and send them to the International Space Station. And so here the next mission was outer space. And the first samples were launched back in March of 2022 and then attached to a special exposure facility outside of the Japanese Kibo module that looks something like this. And well, they spent approximately 283 days or nearly 9 months in orbit around the planet but outside of the capsule itself, completely exposed to the true vacuum and the harsh elements of space. And after 3 years we have our final results. And astonishing results. 
And here, surprisingly, over 80% of all of the spores germinated when returned to Earth. And so even after this prolonged exposure to outer space, when they were returned to the lab, only 20% could not germinate anymore. Which is honestly kind of insane. Basically, after 9 months in space, these plants were still able to reproduce and still turn into actual normal plants. With the scientists concluding that most space conditions, including the vacuum of space, microgravity, and extreme temperature fluctuations outside of the International Space Station, which usually goes between minus 20 degrees Celsius to about 60 degrees Celsius, mostly having a limited impact on the spore survival and practically not affecting them at all. But there was one thing that affected pretty much all of them, UV radiation. And so the samples that were exposed to the full range of solar UV light experienced at least 11% reduction in germination on average, but at least 86% still germinated. And most of the damage in this case was in the mosses photosynthetic system, specifically one pigment known as chlorophyll A, usually damaged and reduced by about 20%. And so if it wasn't for the UV light, and basically if you were to somehow protect these spores, they can most likely survive in outer space for much longer time, and thus, at least in theory, be transported from one object to another, a planet or a moon for example, and still be able to grow in a completely different environment. But I guess the question is, how are they able to survive this? Well here the survival strategy seems to be the result of spongy casing or sporangium surrounding the spores. This structure very likely acts as a crucial protective barrier, shielding the inner spores physically and chemically, while also protecting them from UV damage. And so based on all of this experimental data, scientists then developed a mathematical model trying to figure out so how long can they potentially last in outer space if we were to just basically leave them indefinitely. And well, the model suggests that a typical spore can easily survive up to 5600 days or 15 years, which is more than enough time for a typical asteroid from planet Earth to possibly reach some other planet somewhere in the solar system. Now this would not work for interstellar transfers, because even the nearest star system is going to take hundreds of thousands of years to reach, but for the solar system these are actually promising results. Moreover, because of these results, this also offers us a kind of a biological stepping stone for building actual physical biosystems beyond our own planet or essentially building what's known as bioregenerative life support system for long duration missions in outer space and on other planets. And that's because mosses are now considered to be perfect candidates to fill a lot of roles in outer space missions. Mostly because they're very efficient at absorbing carbon and also efficient at producing oxygen. And of course, because bryophytes were the first group to adapt to terrestrial life on Earth 500 million years ago. And they mostly did this by transforming rocks into soil, which then allowed other species to evolve. And so if one day we introduce these resilient pioneering plants on some other planet like Mars, they potentially can also transform Martian regolith into something a little bit more similar and more fertile to Earth's soil. This concept is actually known as planetary greening. But importantly, the conclusions from this study definitely confirm that quite a lot of different life forms possess necessary intrinsic properties and strategies to endure dramatic extraterrestrial conditions even without any protection or any spacesuit. But this is obviously not the first time scientists have discovered this. Today we know that several other organisms seem to possess these properties and are essentially classified as these extremophiles able to survive and adapt to some super crazy conditions. And well, the most famous candidate for all of this is of course a water bear, or a tardigrade. And these microscopic animals are known to be some of the toughest animals on the entire planet. We've actually discussed their extreme abilities in some of the previous videos in the description, but they're able to survive extreme heat, cold, pressures, dehydration and radiation levels because of their very unusual secret ability. Unlike many other animals on the planet, they're able to create what's known as the Tan state or cryptobiosis as it's also known. And this is essentially a state of suspended animation where they physically dehydrate themselves and become what scientists sometimes refer to as sleepy raisins. And it's in this state that they're then able to survive pretty much everything. And so in 2007, European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency launched these bears on the Photon M3 mission, exposing them to vacuum of space for 10 days. And once they returned to our planet, they were rehydrated once again, with 70% of them surviving and returning back to normal. But similar to the moss spores, exposure to very high UV radiation was devastating. As a matter of fact, in at least one case, only three of them survived, 
when exposed to UV radiation in outer space. And so a lot of research in the last few years basically focused on how exactly they're able to do this, and more importantly, how they're able to enter this state. And turns out that they seem to intentionally induce a burst of free radicals, the molecules that usually cause DNA damage, in order to suddenly enter the state when conditions become too difficult. They also turn their water bodies into a gel-like substance, which then allows them to basically survive any physical damage. And once again, you can learn more about this in one of the previous videos in the description. And well, here we have at least one confirmation that animals, some animals, can also survive in space. But then we also have lichens. And these bizarre beings are a kind of a partnership between fungi and algae or cyanobacteria that are also known for surviving harshest regions on the planet. And so experiments exposing at least one of these lichens, here we're talking about Rusavskia elegans, basically discovered pretty much the same. They can survive vacuum of space, high radiation and cosmic rays, and can technically even survive Martian conditions for at least 18 months, and in some cases not just survive, but even live on Mars. And here after returning to Earth, 71% remain viable, once again suggesting that lichens, in theory, could be used to colonize other planets. And there are even certain types of mushrooms, or specifically fungi, that can survive space as well. For example, certain cryptoendolithic fungi, discovered in Antarctic rocks, were also able to survive international space station conditions, with more than 60% reproducing after 18 months in space. And last but not least, we also have bacteria. And the most famous example here is Deinococcus radiodurans. The bacteria is known to survive some of the most radioactive conditions and that can easily tolerate and survive in conditions that would be deadly to anything else. And right now they seem to have the record. They survived being exposed on the International Space Station for three years. This was also discussed in one of the previous videos, but here we once again have additional proof that quite a lot of organisms have these necessary conditions to survive in space, thus giving this panspermia idea a little bit more credibility. Now it does not mean that life on Earth came from another planet, but it could have. Or maybe life from Earth has actually been transported to other objects, other moons and other planets, and we may find it in the future if we land somewhere else and explore some of those locations. As a matter of fact, there is maybe a chance that if we do go to Mars and start to find a life there, it might have come from Earth. Not from recent missions, but instead from millions and billions of years ago. And that's because we know that both Mars and Earth very often share their meteorites. We've found quite a few meteorites from Mars right here on our own planet, and something similar happens to Mars as well, with many Earth rocks eventually landing on the Martian surface. And though it's quite possible that we've also accidentally transferred some of these bacteria with some of the Martian and some of the lunar missions, right now we have no idea what effects this potentially had, or whether we accidentally contaminated Mars a long time ago. As a matter of fact, another species referred to as Taxicoccus fuenesis tends to survive some of the most rigorous sterilization procedures and has been discovered in what we refer to as the clean rooms, where scientists basically try to sterilize various probes before sending them to outer space. And so right now there's a very high chance that many of these bacteria have already ended up on a lot of different objects. But at least based on some of the evidence we have right now, and especially evidence from these mosses, coupled with research on tardigrades, lichens and bacteria, we now have a kind of a profound conclusion. Life on Earth is way more durable than we ever thought. And a lot of life seems to have inherent capacity to withstand all kinds of stress and all sorts of environments, with even some of the most extreme conditions including vacuum, or super cold and super hot temperatures. Although in this case, the only thing that seems to be most damaging is UV radiation. And right now these discoveries are no longer just academic. Understanding these very specific protective mechanisms used by several different species plays a foundational role in developing these biogenerative life support systems for planned human missions to various objects including the Moon and Mars. And so trying to figure out how tardigrades can create these town states or how fungi can produce these sporophytes may one day even lead to medical discoveries that can help protect our own bodies or at least help us understand how to protect ourselves in dangerous space conditions. But all of this only possible because Earth back then was just not very hospitable. And that means that the next great evolutionary step, which might involve planetary colonization, may also once again start with these animals and these unusual plants because they're just so good at it. 
Anyway, we'll definitely come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, check out previous videos in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. You can also support this channel by buying the Wonderful Person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.